The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. My name is Pei Dong Sun, a uh, distinguished associate professor of arts and science in China and Asian Pacific Studies, associate professor of history at Cornell. I'm pleased to host the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series for the autumn of 2022. The series is connected to two courses I taught this fall, Fashion and the Politics in 20th Century China and Life and Death in China Under Mao. This semester, we will have four distinguished speakers and the first lecture was last month. This month, two leading scholars will bring their new cutting edge research to us via Zoom. They are both women professors whom I have admired since I was a PhD student. They are today's speaker, Professor Antonia Finan, historian, University of Melbourne, Australia, and Professor Deborah Davis, sociologist at Yale University. Her talk will be on October 26th. Same time, same location. We thank all our core sponsors for helping to make this series possible. With their generous support, we are able to bring the last guest speaker of the theory to our Ithaca campus on November the 9th. Professor Simona Seth Regnard is an anthropologist Apologist at the University of Bologna, Italy. Now, it's my great honor and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Professor Antonia Finan. Professor Finan is a historian of China and an honorary professional fellow in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne. Her publications include Speaking of Yangzhou, a Chinese city, 1550 to 1850, Cambridge, uh, Harvard Asian Center, 2004. This book was winner of the 2006 Levinson Prize for work on pre-1900 China. It is so beautifully and gracefully written. I just love it. On and on an entirely different topic, changing clothing in China, fashion, history, nation, New York, Columbia University Press, 2008. This book uh, has been reissued in paperback this year, London first. 2022. Congrats, uh, Antonia, for your contributions to our field. Her new book, How to Make a Mao Suit, Clothing of the People of Communist China, 1949 to 1976, is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. I read most of the its chapters because I was one of the external reviewers of the book manuscript. And I can't wait to use the book in teaching the fashion and the politics class in the fall of 2023. By the way, Antonia has long time interactions with Chinese society and the people. She first visited China as a undergraduate student, your age, huh? in 1972, and has returned there often in the half century since. So the title of her lecture today is Patterns for the People in Communist China. Professor Fernand will talk for 40 minutes or one hour, and we will ask questions 
given the following section for Q and an A. Now, please joining me, welcoming Professor Antonia Finan. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, Peidong. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's um, lovely to be here uh, with you virtually. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. Peidong did in suggest that I fly over, but if you've flown to Australia from Ithaca, you'll know that it takes a long time, and I decided against that. Uh, nonetheless, being with people in person in a room is very different from being with them virtually, I know. And one of the things that I would have done if I were with you virtually is to uh, I'll show you images of some of the materials I have been looking at and allow you to browse through them uh, because these quite unusual research uh, materials uh, have proved to me anyway, full of insights and interest in the uh, time, place and issues that I've been studying. So there's nothing quite like putting your hands on the uh, materials, looking through them, getting a sense of their age, uh, reading what people at that time were writing and imagining what it was like to read those materials. Anyway, we will have uh, on PowerPoint some images of what is inside them. I'm going to go to share screen. So I'm just beginning with an outline of uh, what I'll be covering. So, you know, I'm talking to you from right across the Pacific. China, like Australia, lies on this side of the Pacific, although in the Northern Hemisphere, of course. And we're talking about a place very distant from where you are at this present and also at a time quite distant, a period 60 or 70 years ago, which is perhaps the time of the grandparents of most of you. So this is a time and a place that's hard for us to grasp, I think, in many respects. The whole country, China, early 50s, was traumatised by the violence of war and revolution, which had been ongoing for many years beforehand. I would say people felt at the mercy of forces beyond the control of any one of them. They were like people caught in a hurricane, uh, an, a metaphor that was often used of China at that time. And compared to something like war or a big thing like revolution, I think fashion or what people wore might seem a matter of small importance, hardly a matter of life or death. And I think we need to begin by taking it uh, seriously. And we have recently been reminded of just how serious what people wear and especially what women wear can be when protests in Iran and worldwide erupted following the death of a young woman in Iran just, well, uh, exactly a month ago, on 16th of September. Uh, Mar Masa Amini, a woman who was arrested for failing to cover her hair and died as a result of beating. The coroner's verdict we've recently heard was death due to long-standing illness. In China, during the Cultural Revolution, there were deaths of this nature. The importance of what people wear can't always be illustrated as dramatically as this. But because it was a young woman and not a young man who was beaten to death on account of what she wore, we can also see that fashion or at the very least clothing is an aspect of culture more closely associated in the popular imagination with women than with men. And this is also one of the reasons that historically fashion has been treated lightly as a subject of study. 
I think the word trivial is often used. It's only really since the turn of the century, uh, this century, that the balance has been changing in approaches to it, in, in the waste of the study in the uh, field of history more broadly and in the range of participants. Now, I think contributors from across the gender spectrum write on fashion practices across the gender spectrum. I've not long finished writing a book, as um, Pei Dung has just mentioned, called How to Make a Mouse Suit. After I sent off the manuscript, I started thinking about cover designs. And if I'd planned, thought ahead, I would have got you all to vote on best cover design. This is my pink one. And I've got a yellow one and a, and a blue one. Um, but common to them all is the use of combination of these two images. And using these two images, I wanted to convey something that emerged, that emerged from the research. Uh, one is uh, on the left there, the party official in his, what is usually called in English, the, the Mao suit, the Jung Shan Zhuang, the Jung, Jung Shan suit. And dressed in that suit, he represents the party, the state, authority. Needless, needless to say, this is a very male image. On the right, there is a housewife at her sewing machine making a child's dress. And that's from the front cover of a, a 1950s uh, sewing textbook. So in this lecture, I want to demonstrate that pattern book publishing became a big item in Mao's China. It served to disseminate knowledge about how to make new style clothes, particularly with a sewing machine. And I want to show that it was tied to and influenced by the clothing export industry, which was still in its infant stages. So 1980s, 1990s, in the post Mao era, China suddenly became very big on the world stage uh, for its textile and clothing exports. Uh, but we can certainly see the origins of this back in the 1950s and 60s. At the same time, pattern books, because they were picture books, made available idealized views of men and women in the new China. They revealed, and we could even say that they produced the marginalized position of women in Chinese society, who after all, were not primarily thought of as people wearing these, these Mao suits, these Zhong Shan suits. In, as we'll um, see, instructions on how to measure up a client for the fitted garments worn during, these period, uh, during this uh, period show a general caution or chariness about how to deal with female bodies during the Cultural Revolution in particular, drawing a female figure became more and more challenging to the point where sometimes women are not visible at all in pattern books of that period. So looking through pattern books from the 1950s through to the 1970s, I became uh, sharply aware of the problem of the female body in uh, Maoist society. The altered appearance of the crowd on the Chinese street is a very familiar aspect of Mao's China, that is the years 1949 to 1976. And that appearance is summed up in this 1956 cartoon. It's a cartoon from China, they are sort of self lampooning with everyone dressed more or less alike in uniforms or jufu. And the question I began with uh, in, uh, well, I do begin with in my book uh, is, you know, who makes, who made all these millions 
of uh, clothes, of, of uniforms, of jewel. What was needed in material terms, like in terms of the fabric to make them, the thread, you know, all those buttons, look at all those buttons, not only on, not only used to fasten the coats, but also buttons as uh, ornaments on uh, sleeves or on pockets. Uh, where did all those things come from? And remember, you know, this is an enormous society. There, there are um, hundreds of millions of people, not all of whom got dressed in these uh, clothes, but nonetheless, enough of them in the towns and cities of China uh, to account for very, very large uh, market for these new clothes. How was knowledge of designs, cutting and assembling developed and disseminated? Who did wear these clothes and who didn't? And the answers, I think, reveal an industry that inherited much from the preceding period, the Republic of China. 1912 to 1949. And the, the legacy uh, we can describe in terms of new technologies, uh, new tools, new materials, while inheriting much from the Republic, the People's Republic, China and the People's Republic also broke with that, that legacy in many respects. So family businesses, from the Republican period were destroyed, never to be restored under the People's Republic. The movement from countryside to the city had been absolutely fundamental to supplying uh, raw talent to the cities, including in the area of tailoring. So if you look at a place like Beijing or Shanghai, nearly all of those uh, tailoring businesses in the 1920s and 30s were run by people who came to the cities from the, from the countryside. And then again, at a time when the liberation of women was a mantra, uh, the supply of clothing in China came to be the job of the mother in the home, you know, wasn't she wasn't a factory worker out there, or well, she might have been working in a factory as well, uh, but she wa wasn't in her role as a factory worker that she was producing all these clothes that were worn. It was at home, at night, by the candlelight, by the lamplight, in the middle of the night, while the rest of the family was asleep, um, that she was making these clothes. So the question of how to make a mouse suit actually became a problem for millions of women during this period. I just want to have a brief look at what people have been writing about this period to provide some sort of historiographical um, context. Uh, the, one of the statements that is uh, made is commonly made is that in the Mao years, everyone in China dressed much the same as each other. And there have been a lot of arguments about this, which I won't go into closely now, uh, but much of the conversation about clothing culture in this period does circulate around that problem. That there was no official clothing code, that there were no laws about what people had to wear um, is a point that is made. Uh, in the Chinese Soviet dream is one of many sources for such a such statement. I have made such a statement myself. One of the uh, early points and reiterated points about clothing in China in this period is that despite the fact that, you know, people from outside thought that everyone in China looked the same and there was no difference between men and women and women weren't allowed to be women. Uh, researchers have done much to document the fact that women did in, even if in small and marginal ways, 
assert their femininity in their choices around clothing. At the same time, it is quite clear that a feminist sense of self was being encouraged, particularly in you know, that generation that came into being in uh, 1949. You know, Mao's children, the blank sheet of paper on which he sought to write this new you know, revolutionary and for women you know, feminist ideology. Um, and Pei Dung's wonderful work has shown how from poverty, um, people's sort of inventiveness as well as their pushing back against uh, the, the sort of conformist, uh, standardized uh, modes of dressing, how that produced its own fashions. And I've given you, I guess you've um, probably had access to her article on the collar revolution already. Nearly all of these writers deal at some stage or other with the term Mao Tzu, a reasonably controversial term, but we could say that it refers not only to a garment shown here on the Communist Party leaders on the 1st of October 1949 at the time of the establishment of the People's Republic of China, it also refers to a clothing regime, that is to a standard form of dress in a society, which is, in a sense, you know, a, a hegemonic uh, form, a controlling form. And it refers us to a period of history, the Mao years, from 1949, when the People's Republic of China was established, to 1976, when Mao died, and things began to change, if ever so slowly. History students will be familiar with periodization as a major way of conceptualizing the past. So a period is often defined politically, for example, the Kennedy years. Sometimes it's defined economically, like the Great Depression. Sometimes it's defined by major events, like a war, sometimes by culture, like the Dark Ages, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. Mapping out how people think is a major method of periodization. But there's also strong visual imagery associated with it. So in historical costume dramas um, or in picture books, periods are often encapsulated by what people wear. So something like Game of Thrones, for example, is generally regarded as medieval because of the costume. Um, that are worn, even though many aspects of the story, as has been argued, are, are quite modern. In China, periodization is overwhelmingly political. People talk about dynasties or the ruling house, Tang China, Qing China, rather like, uh, I guess, Tudor England or Stuart England. And in the 20th century, this means the basic period that the basic periodization is the late Qing, the Republic of China, and the People's Republic of China. And in costume terms, the periodization looks something like I've shown you here. In each of these periods, there were marked changes over time. But most people in China, I think, will be able to look at this and have a general sense of where these um, clothes belong uh, in this century. Now, of course, people in China wear, you know, just contemporary international styles, which they, which China as often as not produces for the rest of us to wear. But one of the arguments that I make in this book is that the change of political regime in 1949 meant a change of clothing regime. And this was in accordance with historical precedent. So although uh, to talk about new China was a standard way of talking about revolutionary China in the 1950s, there, was, uh, there were many respects in which it was working to a cultural pattern. So there was a saying in old China, when the dynasty changes, the clothing is altered. 
in 1950s China, there were no laws that everyone in the country should dress in a particular way. Nonetheless, a new standard of dress was immediately apparent. It was pivoted on what foreigners called the Mao suit, and it was immensely powerful uh, within Chinese society. So that general sense of conformity and uh, sameness that people from outside of China observed and that they observed of, of themselves uh, was true to an historical pattern of when the dynasty changes, the clothing is altered. This periodization is very evident in the dress of ordinary people. So ceremonial dress, most obviously in weddings, is one example. On the left-hand side, you know, she's wearing a chipa, he's wearing a, a long gown and jacket. On the right-hand uh, side, she's wearing a linen suit. He's wearing, you know, a very homemade looking uh, Mao suit, Zhong Shan suit. Both, both of these are uh, couples getting married again in very recognizably different periods. Everyday dress for work and leisure is another example. And here the staff at Beijing Library in 1936 above and in 1976. A absolute sea change. Can you imagine what it, what it was like to move from wearing, you know, this sort of fairly loose fitting long uh, gown that wrapped around you to wearing these uh, trousers and short coats. The, uh, a really major change in sort of bodily experience terms, as well as in terms of, you know, industry production of um, the wardrobe for the nation. So this um, jacket and trousers style had its origins in dress for officials of the nationalist regime, which was in power between 1928 and 1949, and uh, is always attributed to Sun Yat-sen, the so-called father of the uh, Republic. Both the communists and the nationalists claim the legacy of Sun Yat-sen, so we shouldn't be surprised to see these warring parties wearing having the same sort of bureaucratic costume so there's Chiang Kai-shek on the uh, left head of the Nationalist Party and Mao Zedong the paramount leader uh, of the communists um, both looking as though they're separated at birth pretty much in vestimentary terms and you can see at a glance how dif differently they dressed from officials of the Qing dynasty you know which after all ended only in 1911. And here's Li Hongzhang, who died in 1901 in that typical sort of long gown and, um, and loose fitting uh, jacket. So a really, really marked uh, change. So the Mao suit really stood at the apex of tailored garments in 1970s uh, China. Well, I should actually say that the Mao suit, you know, can sometimes be talked about as uh, a loose term uh, for the Zhongshan suit, which you can see here in the top left-hand uh, corner with all the, uh, with the four pockets. So, and the four pockets is a way of uh, referring uh, to it in some sort of, in some dialectical references. Uh, all these other uh, clothes are more or less exactly the same uh, pattern. So if you go to pattern books, you'll find that the pattern is exactly the same, except for uh, differences in the pockets and the collars. So the other sense in which the Mao suit is used is to refer to all of these clothes, which from a distance, which, you know, if people are wearing their, you know, their blue or their green or their grey, they would all look much of a much, and you'd have to look up close and knowledgeably to know what you were, know the differences between them. So the the the, the Zhongshan suit uh, with its four pockets supplied the blueprint for this range of men's suits, which were collectively known as you know the uniforms or jufu. 
And in Beijing, which became the new capital in 1949, it really took only a short time for the Jufu Rook to become established. And the effect was to displace those older forms of clothing. So in the space of a decade, I guess, a few million long gowns were replaced by a rather greater number of uh, Jufu of various sorts, ranging from the Zhongshan suit itself with its four pockets in wool to you know, a homemade people's suit in cotton. So as I said, my question was, how was this achieved? And one of the ways in practice that it was done, I made reference to the problem of supply of fabric. One of the ways in practice that it was done was to cut down old clothes to make these new clothes. And here we can see an old gown, a long gown, unpicked, laid out flat, and on top of it superimposed the pieces needed to make the suit coat of, uh, of a Zhongshan suit or a student suit or whichever one of the many varieties of Ma suit you, were got, you needed to wear. You can also see at a glance how much more complex it was to make a Zhongshan coat than to make a long gown. There were so many pieces, so much sewing up to be done. <coughs> In looking at how uh, this transformation was achieved, we need to begin with the tailors, in particular with the red brick tailors, the Hungbang. Immigrants from Ningbo, got a little map here showing Ningbo just below Shanghai, uh, which was it, Ningbo was itself uh, an important port uh, in the past, but these uh, tailors, as uh, more or less, uh, suggested uh, earlier, uh, came from the countryside, not from the city itself. They were immigrants to Shanghai and in Shanghai in the later 19th century, they uh, became the major suppliers of clothing in the first instance to foreigners in Shanghai. And they learnt the art of making uh, Western style suits from patterns that were provided to them by the foreigners, either paper patterns, which in English were known as musters, or uh, they might unpick an old suit and see how it was done and then uh, use that as the blueprint for their new suit. So this red group, the red group dominated Western, tailor, Western tailoring in China for at least a century, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th. Uh, they, would, they passed, they developed, they became tremendously reputable, uh, not only in Shanghai, to a lesser extent in um, Beijing, but also overseas in Japan. So, sorry, cut off the uh, place name here, but in Yokohama, uh, big foreign port, they were also you know, the top tailors there. Then after 1949, many of them left uh, China, left Shanghai for Hong Kong uh, or Taiwan or even Japan. Um, but those that remain turned from making Western suits to making Mao suits. So the uh, basic professional capacity of the tailoring industry in China to produce uh, good, well-cut, uh, Mao suits uh, was due to the expertise developed by these red group tailors. And I've shown you here just a picture of just one of these. This is Gu Tianyun, who is author of the first uh, Chinese guide in Chinese to Western tailoring. And his 1933 book was plundered by uh, pattern book writers in the 1950s who used it. Um, to, for their own illustrations of how to measure up, how to cut, and so on. Gu Tianyu, like many of these Ningbo tailors, went from Ningbo to Japan, then back to Shanghai, where he established his uh, business and reputation. 
again, like many red brick tailors, leaving Shanghai in 1949 and in, in the end uh, going back to Japan. So the tailors, you could say, were agents of change. They brought about this change using new tools. And I'm sh showing you here uh, images from a century apart. The first is a Ningbo tailor. Uh, sorry, it should be 1849 there, drawn in 1849 by, um, who was he? Cobalt, um, a British, maybe even Scottish, anyway, uh, missionary who was in uh, Ningbo for a few years. And he has an extensive description, written description of tailoring, but you can see here on the table, the cut out uh, pattern of that, you know, again, a very simple cut out pattern in one piece of a robe, which in this case is going to be buttoned up at the front. You can also spot his tools. So here are the light uh, scissors with their snake handles. Here's a ruler for measuring. Here's a little pouch with uh, chalk in it and a string to pull through and the string would be used for marking out the lines for cutting. Uh, here is, is actually, though it doesn't look very much like what we think of as an iron, is, an, is a clothes iron, which was a simply an open mouth ladle filled with hot coals and he's blowing off the ash there so it won't dirty the clothes before he irons the piece of cloth. Now, most of these simple tailor's tools lasted through the next century, but alongside new tools. Here on the uh, right-hand side, we can see weighted sewing shears, which were very important for cutting woolen cloth in particular. Down here, we can see that the uh, clothes, the old fashioned open ladle iron was still in use, but alongside it is the electric iron. Curling around here, we can see the soft tape measure, which was introduced in the early uh, 20th century, and which was absolutely necessary to the task of measuring up people to make the clothes. And in addition to tools, there's something that we call notions, all the bits and pieces that go to either making the garment beautiful or to making it functional. And one of the big things that was introduced to China in the late 19th and early 20th century are these hard buttons. They were made of, um, might be made of shell, of glass, of metal, but in, in any event, they replaced the old uh, cloth uh, button. So most of you are probably familiar with the standard uh, Chinese style button, which in English is often called frog fastening, made with a strip of uh, cloth that is turned into a knot and then put, put through a loop. Interestingly, Chinese style buttons, you know, they have their own history. Buttoning really became, those Chinese style buttons really became uh, widespread during the sort of 17th, 18th centuries before the Qing dynasty. You know, people usually uh, use ties rather than uh, buttons. So we can talk about the Qing dynasty as, you know, it's a very buttoned up sort of dynasty, but their buttons were uh, increasingly replaced towards the end of the dynasty in the late 19th and early 20th century by these uh, imported buttons. And then in due course by import replacements because Chinese button makers themselves emerged in the uh, 10s and 20s. Now, buttons are very useful things. You know, you can sort of buy them and sew them on, but they need buttonholes. One of the great changes in intensity of labor in making clothes in China, uh, apart from all the you know, bits and pieces of, the, of a coat that needed to be sewn together, 
you have to sew all the buttonholes. You can't just make a slit and put the button through. You have to edge it. You can see here all the tiny stitches that go into it. So uh, buttonholing was a major task for relatively unskilled sewers uh, during the Mao years. Poorly paid, very laborious, very necessary if people's clothes were to stay buttoned up. These changes in tailoring and clothing styles coincided with sweeping social change, including the rise of girls' education. So sewing was, was traditionally regarded as things girls should do, but it was things that they learned at home. When girls' schools were established, sewing lessons came along with them. Interestingly, sewing in, uh, well, in well-to-do households anyway, had always meant embroidery rather than making clothes. Making clothes was something that the humble tailor did, not that well-to-do, well-born young ladies did. In the uh, 19-teens, 20s, uh, this making of clothes uh, was gradually taken on by uh, young women, usually for domestic purposes, occasionally for commercial purposes, uh, but bear in mind, the tailoring was almost uniquely a male profession uh, through to the 1950s. Sewing uh, machines uh, introduced, uh, I guess, Singer, the Singer sewing machine was the, uh, the big brand in China, uh, imported from the factory in uh, Glasgow, uh, and itself in due course facing competition from import replacement as the Chinese started making their own sewing machines. So in the first half of the 20th century, we can see this, uh, this is a school in 1919 equipped with sewing machines. We can see this sort of ground being laid for a phenomenon that would become very obvious during the Mao years. There was not a smooth transition from the Republic to the People's Republic. Whatever we can say about the legacy and the roots, there were dramatic changes in scale. So this goes for the sewing machine industry, which was just, you know, minuscule. Uh, the, the, the local sewing machine industry, minuscule in the 1940s. In the 1950s, expanded dramatically as China shut its borders to imports particularly to American imports, Japanese imports, interestingly, uh, fared a little bit better. But the Chinese sewing machine industry really took off in the 1950s, expanding in the 1960s till there was a sewing machine factory in practically every city of any importance. Sewing schools too went from, or sewing classes um, went from you know, being a class in, in girls' schools or a part-time evening college to these sort of intense uh, uh, classes uh, run in great number uh, in many cities of China in the 1950s. This proliferation of sewing schools was in part what they usually describe as, as responding to the government's call. Responding to the government's call, someone will set up a sewing machine, a, a sewing school and invite uh, students to apply, invite women to apply. Women did apply and they applied for a number of reasons. First, they needed skills themselves, a lot of occupations, uh, a lot of things that people did before 1949 could not possibly be done after 1949 for all sorts of economic, organisational and ideological reasons. Making clothes and uh, selling them was something that uh, could be done with impunity under in the new regime. So Wang Guizhang, one of the great uh, authors of uh, pattern books in the early 1950s is uh, a fine example 
of this, you know, moving from you know, a, a professional role into the role of sewing instructor. I am guessing that she is probably the daughter of, you know, a successful tailor or someone successful in the textiles and apparel, biz apparel business. She went to the one of the top universities in Shanghai, St. John's, and graduated from there with a degree in chemistry. Uh, but then, come 1949, you know, was looking around for something to do. Very difficult for people from this sort of, you know, well-to-do background, giving it a good address, you know, with obvious money behind her. Very good for her, very easy, very difficult for her to find a place in the first instance. And she set up a very, very successful sewing school and um, published uh, a long uh, series of books, which were not only used as textbooks for her sewing students, but also used for correspondence uh, school for, with uh, correspondence from around the country writing in for the materials. Even tailors might turn to teaching instead of tailoring. And in this graduation photo, we can see all the teachers in the front row. At least the men would all have done their apprentice, apprenticeships as tailors before moving into, uh, as, as instructors into the Daxiong Sewing School in uh, Beijing. This is one of the longest, longest lasting private sewing schools uh, but you can see that apart from the front row of teachers there are no men in this uh, class and indeed the government in the 1950s made it quite clear that it uh, desired the feminization of the clothing industry men were needed for muscular work in the uh, heavy industry such as steel making and there were in various jurisdictions, uh, regulations introduced to uh, limit the intake of students into you know, students in sewing schools to female applicants. And the first great outpouring of pattern books were a response to the need for teaching materials in the sewing schools and we can see here uh, down the bottom uh, part of the series that were developed by Wang Guizhang. A lot of the uh, early pattern books were uh, written in conjunction with guides to how to sell the sewing, uh, how to use a sewing machine. So guides to using a sewing machine would come accompanied by numbers of patterns in the back with instructions about how to put uh, the clothes together. All of these early pattern books were produced by uh, privately owned uh, businesses, by, by private individuals, and we can identify the names of the writers and the designers and so on. We know a little bit about numbers of them. As time went on, all those private businesses, most of the private schools shut down. Uh, most of the individuals involved with them sort of disappear from sight. Instead, we have a developing bureaucracy to govern the, the making designing uh, making and designing of clothes and the associated making and designing of pattern books so you see see here on the left you know a certain standardization from these sort of various little sewing books we now have these landscape format very for, very standard across a large number of cities um, and in no case can we identify who are the authors. So a collective authorship replaces the individual authorship of the early pattern books. It's 
So I just want to make these notes about the pattern books. First of all, they're a characteristic publication of the Mao years. There were some pattern books before 1949. Embroidery pattern books have a long history in China. Clo how to make clothing, you know, this is a little bit rare. Uh, you'll find some school textbooks uh, produced for this end. Then in the early 1950s, they were produced as teaching materials by sewing schools. Then from the late 50s through to the 80s, produced uh, for sewing co-ops. The sewing co-ops are mostly staffed by graduates of the sewing schools. And they're also used by home dresses, uh, by home dressmakers. They're used in addition by the clothing shoe and hat companies, which are the, which are the um, sort of core to the bureaucratic organization of, of the apparel industry. And they're used in clothing factories. Clothing factories might be extremely small scale. And in those, you know, you often have uh, a process of sort of people learning on the job. So the very early pattern books do show a confusion of modernities. You know, these people are moving into conscious, they're all conscious of being, becoming citizens of a new China. They're all conscious of a revolutionary change. The prefaces to the early pattern books show a forward engagement with the new politics. What they, what they actually drew and designed and presented to their readers or to their students was, however, a real mix of things. Very obviously, you know, we have here with her bobbed um, cut, the, the fashion that's from the communist fashion from Yinan, uh, looking uh, very, you know, a la mode. Uh, but in the, in the very same book, you know, you would have something like clots or even a two-piece two -piece bathing costume, which would not usually be imagined as something that you would find in Mao's China. These sort of clothes disappear very um, quickly and are only evident in the, the most expansive of the early uh, school. Uh, directed pattern books. More obviously, the pattern books were directed at instructing uh, dressmakers and tailors how to make the clothes that people were not only expected to wear, wear if they were in particular occupations, but also wanted to wear because it felt like this was the dress of their times. And I think this is an excellent photo of young women in Beijing looking very much as though, very much at home in their linen suit, as though this was, you know, very much the cutting edge of clothing styles at that time. So pattern books, both these early private ones and the later collectively authored ones were deliberately instructional. They were pedagogical. There was a major campaign to disseminate knowledge about the new style of clothes and the new ways of making them. The very simplest pattern books, I should emphasize, focused only on the jufu, on the uniforms in all their sort of limited variety. The instructional aspect of pattern books is clear from the way in which the budding industry, sewing industry sought to align itself with the progressive socialist world. This principally meant the socialist, uh, the Soviet Union. So here you can see uh, a, a variety of uh, shirts so again you know not great variety but anyway some variety different pockets slightly different cuts and they've got different names and the different names served to
to help people, as it were, wear socialism on their backs. They're sort of in step with their times. So the Michurin's uh, shirt, Michurin uh, was a, a botanist who was working on, you know, developing uh, new uh, breeds of uh, plant. And a, a film was made of him in 1947, which was shown in China. So Soviet films were a great uh, source of cultural inspiration in China in the 1950s. The Michurin sh uh, shirt, um, the peace shirt, number five, is another one. So there was an international peace uh, movement, which was made much of in China. There was a big peace conference in China in 1952 and the peace shirt has its name from there. At the same time, you know, we still have things like the Hawaiian shirt, you know, which, you know, it's a name floating in from outside, left over from the old Republic. It's a term that soon disappears. Shanghai style things. Uh, and this is a Beijing pattern book, right? Shanghai style things, shang things that are named Shanghai carry their own frisson. Shanghai retained its enormous uh, eclat, its uh, reputation for being the city of fashion. Children's clothes remained recognizably modern global uh, in the 50s and 60s. They start, however, to become less and less important a component of a sewing books. So early sewing books, sometimes absolutely dominated by children's clothes, attesting to the importance of these pattern books for home dressmakers, you know, making clothes for the kids. Later on, Cultural Revolution, you know, you'll just have one or two little patterns at the back and this very decorative style of clothing Though, though it never completely disappears, really uh, fades considerably. As time goes on, the sewing machine and uh, moves into the countryside, and we start seeing advertisements. Of, we start seeing designs also for how to uh, cut and machine sew garments in the Chinese fashion, which are still worn in the countryside. Again, if you compare the jacket and trousers here uh, in the Chinese style with the jacket, with the jacket and trousers in the Western style, the, the Mao suit, the Zhong Shan suit, you can see the difference in complexity of making and imagine how much more labor is taken to make these, you know, these modern sort of city uh, clothes compared to the simple clothes of the past. In 1956, we see a sudden turn in pattern book publishing. The authorities decided they were sick of everyone just wearing these clothes, these same clothes, uh, all looking the same, that it wasn't a good advertisement for the new China, and they wanted women to wear more skirts. We have a sudden flurry of pattern books, uh, which are presenting a range of clothes, which were actually quite rarely wore, uh, seen on the uh, street, but that did set the uh, did set the style of pattern book publishing for the next few years. I just want to make the point that in this in developing these, an engagement with the, with a sort of modern, uh, how do I say, a modern fashionable aesthetic for uh, Chin Chinese people and especially Chinese women, it's quite evident that both the publishers and the dress designers were coping with a range of contradictions. The decorative uh, aesthetic could go in a couple of directions. One was back to a sort of recognizably Chinese uh, past, 
And we can see that in the cover here, which is shown this young woman dressed in a very beautifully embroidered chipa. And the other is in a very sort of modern Western global uh, sort of style. Interestingly, the, the modern Western global style had a better market in China at that time, judging by the sale of pattern books, because Wang Wei Zhang wrote uh, two pattern books side by side in 1956, one of which was quite conservative and, and atavistic in its uh, aesthetics, uh, celebrating uh, a more traditional Chinese mode of wear. And that had obviously passed its time because that pattern book uh, went through relatively few reprints. The other one, which was more recognizably um, practical, suited to modern life, and also in tune with, you'd have to say, uh, modern world uh, trends in dress, went through many, many uh, reprints and much later was even reprinted in Hong Kong as well. So there were these tensions about how to move and how to engage in an area of life in which finally Chinese society didn't have all that much time or leisure to engage with at all. As I've said, this 1956 turn towards, you know, uh, towards a, a a style of fashion and fashion publishing had its, had a long-term impact. During the years of the Great Leap Forward, we can see that pattern books are notice, noticeably more professional than those of the early 50s. Graphic design and presentation is improved. Color printing begins to become more common. The Great Leap Forward is otherwise known as a time of scarcity leading up to famine. So 1958-62 is one of the terrible periods of uh, Chinese history. Even in big cities, severe rationing was enforced. So it's quite bizarre looking through the pattern books published in this period to find such you know, modish uh, designs being uh, presented for as if they were clothing that could be uh, bought or could be made and worn by peasantry at the time. The amount of cloth that people were able to had at their disposal at this time was very small indeed. And while peasants could, could weave their own cloth, the shortage of food was such that they, cloth, they disposed of their cloth where they could on the black market in the towns. From the misfit, from what people were making and wearing and, and what they were wearing and what the pattern books say, we can conclude two things, I guess, about this period. One was that the Great Leap Forward was a time when a vault of ambitions and claims, and you can't believe anything that was read or printed at that time. Uh, uh, the other is that the clothing industry was beginning to have an export arm, which is obvious even in these very hard years, or perhaps particularly in these hard years when the Chinese government is trying to get foreign currency to pay for imports, among other things, of wheat. One of the problems in the clothing industry uh, as this ex export industry expanded was to prevent things destined for overseas, including ideas from circulating internally. During the Cultural Revolution, those slightly adventurous styles evident in the um, Great Leap Fall publications, and we can see an example here, this is the front cover of a 1960s Shanghai magazine. These fade from view, and we get these sort of more shapeless uh, shirts and trousers being produced in, 19, in the early 1970s, but still for export. So uh, the lower end market in Hong Kong 
and Southeast Asia is buying up these clothes that are being exported uh, from China. So bear in mind, I've shown you quite a, quite a few color pictures here, which are pretty, but bear in mind that color printing was by no means standard. Overwhelmingly publications were black and white with simple line drawings. And overwhelmingly, um, the juful, the male suit, the student suit, the youth uh, suit are the common feature and they're uh, it's often sort of very up front. Sorry, I'm running um, over time here. I'll just quickly refer now to the fact that much as the clothing uh, materials were, much as these design books, these pattern books were instructional in terms of what people uh, could or should or might wear, so too they are instructional in terms of how the body uh, should or could be treated. And one of the things that's, that I took note of as I was browsing through these decades of our publication was the treatment of women's bodies and the extreme sensitivity around anything regarding touching a woman's body. And finally, of even representing something like a woman's breasts. So here we have the tailor measuring up the man. We only have hands measuring up the woman. Here we have the varieties of body uh, that tailors should design for. Um, you know, if you, I just ask you to spot the woman or spot the women. And of course, it's only one of those standardized shapes. Men have many standardized shapes. There are many designs for uh, the male suit for many sorts of men. There are hardly any, there's hardly any ever any variety for women. During the Cultural Revolution, we have this very close uh, detailed measurement of men for every aspect of their fitted male suits. For women, extremely simple, uh, minimalist types of measurement. In the Cultural Revolution, the measurements, the women and the men almost look the same. Uh, and the so that you would think you could use the same figure for all of the measurements, despite the obvious uh, secondary sexual uh, differences between the two, uh, between male and female bodies as you know, normally presented. And one of the consequences of this avoidance of having to deal with women's measurements and bodies is that women become less and less visible in pattern books of this um, period. So in this particular pattern book, you know, there was just one, I'll show you there, the one woman in all the many uh, figure drawings of either measuring or of clothes in the entire book. Again, we can see here the predominance of the juriful, again, very uh, male-centered, uh, treatment of clothing designs generally in this particular pattern books the only particular the only views we have of women is of a country girl in her chinese style jacket and an old granny with her uh, child in arms and this imbalance of men's and women's designs uh, lasted through to the uh, post mao period so here is quite a, in this 1977-78 publication, we see a, a clear shift in style of publishing. You know, the girl has permed hair. She's wearing a, a colored jacket with a fur collar. But when we look inside, we find, you know, a total of something like you know, nine to whatever it is, you know, many men's uh, clothing designs and just four for women of which one is the artificial collar of which Sun Pei Dung has written. So the whole of this uh, enormous publishing industry, uh, as it sort of grew exponentially through the Cultural Revolution, uh, so that you know what started off as 
tens or hundreds of thousands of copies became millions upon millions. The proportion of uh, women depicted or the, the proportion of women's clothes uh, presented uh, in them become fewer and fewer. So I'm going to just leave you with this uh, final slide, which was among the thoughts I had about ways of thinking about what I had been writing. Mary Beaudry's wonderful uh, book, Findings, the Material Culture of Needlework and Sewing, done by an archaeologist, uses this term small find big histories, which I think encapsulates the significance of some of these research materials. I agree with Tina May Chen, clothing was a critical component in producing the subject of the new regime. I find uh, Bregenti's observation about visibility, all kinds of useful, all kinds of minorities and exploited classes, and I mean here women, experience the effects of invisibility as lack of recognition. Women looking through those design books and finding no pictures of women would feel the lack of recognition. And finally, we can see in uh, Michelle Foucault's History of sexuality, numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugations of bodies and the control of populations do exist. And I think that pattern books were one of the ways in which the subjugation was affected. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the slow start. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Antonia, uh, for this uh, excellent uh, talk. I guess uh, that's a set for, I guess for me, that's uh, Professor Penan again set up a classical example um, on how we can use the small things to tell a grand history, right? And uh, you, we, we see how, you know, we can investigate the uh, PRC history through the lens of fashion and how the material culture can help us to better understand the, uh, you know, the, uh, the history and also the mindset of the people who live or who have survived in the history uh, after, after 1949. And also that's not only a um, clothing regime issue. It's a vestimentary order. It is a uh, social order. It is how the power or how the state uh, navigate the power through, you know, uh, accessing the influence on people's daily life. And uh, ultimately, you can see obviously that's related, closely related a cultural norm, a new norm in the post-1949.